Well, for those who haven't been here uh, the, the weekend, I know that you have, do not know who our special speaker is for this weekend. And uh, so it's my pleasure to reintroduce uh, our brother and uh, uh, Paul with us. Paul Lamy, or Dr. Paul Lamy, um, is uh, the uh, church planter and senior pastor of Grace Community Church of Huntsville, Alabama. John is still in Los Angeles. But uh, another Grace Community Church in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, uh, what makes that church um, a little extra special, too, is it's part of the coalition of churches that are, uh, that are campuses, um, that is a campus um, for the Expositor Seminary. And so Paul is a, a board member and a faculty member, and he teaches the pastoral ministry classes there. And he has just been such a, uh, he has uh, been such an able and encouraging uh, messenger of the Lord this weekend. It is a joy to not only call him uh, my uh, brother, but it is a privilege to call him my friend. And so, Paul, please give us the message this morning. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It has been so good to be with you, <clears throat> and uh, I think my voice has one more sermon in it, um, and then by tonight it'll be done. Um, but you have been so hospitable uh, to me, and, and I know to these visiting missionaries, and I just want to thank you for your love for the body of Christ, not only here but at large, uh, that this is a great reminder of how we are connected to one another. and. If you are in Christ and I'm in Christ, we're going to be together forever. And this is just a dress rehearsal. This is just a warm-up. And, and dress rehearsals don't always go the way we want, right? Uh, and so there's bumps and bruises along the way in life. And, but brothers and sisters, we're going to be together forever, always with the Lord, rejoicing. And we're going to see the completion of what this weekend represents. There will be no missions in heaven uh, in the eternal state. Uh, it will be done. It will be finished. The work of God will be done in, in, in the sense of calling disciples to himself. And so we will be rejoicing forever around that wonderful truth and around our glorious Lord Jesus. And that's what we've been talking about this weekend. We've been, uh, as uh, part of our study for the missions conference, looking at Romans 15. And this morning we come to Romans 16. And this may seem like the, the oddest text ever for a missionary conference. It, it doesn't make sense on the surface of it. In fact, uh, just in a regular sermon series, some might get to Romans 16 and think, what do I do with that? Or you're reading through the Bible and you've probably read through Romans before and you get to Romans 16 and you, you wonder, it's just a list of names. But actually there's more to this than just a list of names. And, and we're hopefully going to see that here this morning. Uh, but Let's be honest, on the surface, it, it doesn't necessarily jump off the page to us like some of the other well-known passages in Romans. You think of Romans 1, 16 and 17 for, uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation, both for the Jew and for the Greek. I mean, these are powerful statements made all throughout. We think of Romans 8. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. We think of Romans 8.1, uh, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These are declarative, wonderful, life-giving, and uh, sustaining statements that Paul makes throughout Romans. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. Just all over and over and over again, all throughout Romans. And then we get to Romans 16, and Paul starts to give a list of names. And we think, oh, well, what do I do with that? Uh, one writer said it this way. He says, this list of names in this section does not make for very interesting reading for most students of Romans. And if we're honest, that might be our persuasion. Well, one of the things I, I hope to do today is to show you that this is more than just a list of names. Just as much as Romans chapters 1 through 15 are the inspired word of God, so is chapter 16. And Paul has it here, the Apostle Paul has it here for a reason. Uh, but if we're honest, I think many people pass over sections like this because it might be confusing. And it may be confusing like an opera. Yes, an opera. I like all kinds of music. 
Uh, I, I, I just love to learn about music. I, I can't play any instrument but the radio. Uh, my whole family sings and plays instruments, and, and the Lord in his providence and maybe his goodness toward everyone else did not allow me to uh, play an instrument or those kind of things, but I love to sing and I love to uh, learn about music. And, and once upon a time, many years ago, I attended an opera not once, but three times. I, I gave it a try. And, and there may or may not have been a young lady involved, uh, which was the motivation for that. Uh, but, I, but I attended the opera and uh, wasn't a fan. I was a, a jock. I was a football player and those kind of things. And so I was kind of a fish out of water going to this. But then I heard uh, more recently, uh, I was reading someone, and they were explaining how an opera works. And, and if you've ever been to one or you're just generally familiar with that, you would, you would understand what he's saying here. How it, on the surface, it seems like a cacophony of confusion. It just seems like all of these different parts and things that are happening, it doesn't make much sense. And that still may be our verdict on an opera, but there is more to it if we're honest. He said this, when you hear the opera for the first time, it's overwhelming. There are 22 people on the stage. They're all singing different words at the same time and often in an adversarial manner. You know how one will speak over here and one will speak over here and they're singing at each other in different parts. And from a seat far up in the rafters, you're expected to make sense of it as a coherent whole, which you can't because at first it's just chaos. The orchestra is doing one thing. The chorus is doing something else. The soloists are running back and forth, arguing and cooperating and switching their effects on a dime. And to make matters worse, it's all in a language you don't speak. But if you stick at it, it starts to make sense. As your ears grow accustomed to the soundscape, the pick, you pick out a line here, a plot point there, an exchange over in the corner until eventually you are able to prevent yourself from following the loudest person on the stage and to watch the whole thing develop on the whole, on the aggregate. It all starts to come together. And you see that this person over here doing their own thing and this one over here and the orchestra down here, it's all actually telling one big story. This description of the opera could also be a description of the church. You've got this person running around over here doing their thing, another one over here, and you've got another one up here directing things and and speaking louder than everyone else. You've got the orchestra playing. You've got the the band. You've got all of these things. We can make a couple of mistakes when we come to passages like Romans 16. Uh, We might come to this and we think this is just like an opera. It's confusion. But I would encourage you to stay tuned and watch what the Lord is doing here. But some of those mistakes would be we come to Romans 16 and we think this is not for us the way the other 15 chapters are for us. We think there's not really anything in this for me. Or we might even be tempted to say more than what Paul intended. What do we have here in Romans 16? I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm going to make some comments along the way as we read through a selection of of most of these verses and see and get to meet some of these peoples that are here. But as you just stare at the page here for a second, look at it in your Bibles and you see Really starting in verse 1 all the way through verse 23, just a list of names of peoples with some descriptions attached to them. There's 26 individuals, more than anywhere else in Paul's writings, multiple family relationships, and at least three churches that are meeting at that time in houses. Nine women are referenced. Most of the names in this list are Gentiles. Some are Jews. A majority of those are slaves or freedmen. And we know those kind of things because of the types of names and some of the places that are associated with them and so on. We want to be careful here, but there's something important also that we see that I think is good and helpful. And this church has done this throughout this weekend and continues to do it today. That it's actually helpful to single out people who are helpful encouragements to the body of Christ. 
to take note of those gifts and those services and those ministries that, that make the church what it is. To just to be honest, and I'm speaking for myself and my own church and for Pastor David and, and others like us, it's, it's real easy for you to think that we are the ones who are making everything happen. But we know the truth. We know that's not the case. That the body of Christ is truly a body that is working together and supporting so many things and doing so many things and certainly in the cause of missions as we will see here. Paul avoids, as he calls out these people, a couple of things that I think is instructive for us. You'll notice on the one hand that he doesn't merely flatter people. You know, flattery is sin, where where you say something to someone's face that you wouldn't say behind their back. You know, it's the opposite of gossip. Uh, flattery is where you're saying things nicely. It's really to get an angle, to get into their life, or, or to get in good graces with them. But it's not something that you really believe, or maybe something that's not even true. Paul doesn't do that. Paul's not a sinful flatterer here. That's not what he's doing. But here's a, the other extreme. Here's something else he's not doing. He doesn't forget He doesn't forget all the people and the the names and the faces and the men and the women and the families who make the church what it is, not only in the church, the congregation where he might be serving, but how they have joined with even other churches. We can learn from Paul here that the church is a diverse opera that the Lord is conducting, and it's all designed to magnify his name. Many different personalities stories, backgrounds, ages, gifts, but all with one voice. You know, just like your church. I love that about your church and my church, how there's different accents and different languages and different backgrounds and countries that are represented, and and, and it's a beautiful thing. For us, it's like the Apostle Paul is like a great-grandfather. He he pulls out a picture out of his pocket, and he tells us about the folks that are in the picture. You ever been at a family reunion and, and the oldest person there, they, they pull out an old picture where that predates you by many generations, maybe decades, and they start to tell you, let me tell you about this person. You never knew them, but let me tell you how they had an impact on my life. Let me tell you what they did for us back in the old country. Let me tell you about how they used to cook and how they used to meet needs. Well, imagine, if you will, that Paul's doing something like this. This is great-grandfather, the Apostle Paul. And he pulls out a picture and he says, let me tell you about some of these people. And here we are 2,000 years later, far removed from all of these people and their cultures and their generation and all of those things. And Paul, here at the end of Romans, pulls out a picture. And he says, will you look at this? It's amazing. Why is this in Romans? Well, I believe that the, type of, the types of people that Paul mentions here in Rome are the same kinds of people that are found in every healthy church, no matter where you go, no matter what country you go to. They are absolutely crucial to the ongoing health and the sustaining and furthering of the mission of the local church. So you might be sitting here this morning asking, what part do I play in the mission of God? We've been saying throughout the weekend, and you heard it again this morning, that the mission of the church is to make and nurture disciples. And we're all involved in that process. Some involved in one aspect more than the other, but we're all involved in that process. So I really I want to ask a question this morning. What's in a name? What's in a name? I love hearing about some of your names. Uh, you know, uh, Miguel, uh, Michael the, the Angel, right? I believe that's your middle name. Uh, uh, we, we hear all kinds of things. And when you hear certain people's names, it tells you something of their background. I mentioned yesterday, my name is Paul St. John Lamy. Uh, it, that tells you something if you come from a Catholic background. It tells you that my parents were once Roman Catholics. My grandparents were Roman Catholics, and they had hopes for me. Uh, And it didn't turn out like they wanted necessarily. Uh, But uh, they they, they got a, a minister of sorts, but it wasn't the one maybe that they anticipated. What's in a name? Our names say something. Our names mean something. And, and the same is true here. But I want to ask that question as we begin to look at this. And let's jump into the text this morning. If you'll look at Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, the first thing we see here, and I'm going to give you some types of people that Paul mentions. Number one, what's in a name? We, we find that there are redeemed servants. 
serving in the church, redeemed servants. In verse 1, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. We also see that it's, it's good for church members to have certain and varied reputations. This dear woman has a reputation. Phoebe had a past. How do we know that? Because it's right there in the name. The name Phoebe means bright or radiant, but it's, that doesn't tell the whole story. In that time, it would tell us that she came from a pagan background, as Phoebe was the name in Greek mythology for Artemis, the goddess of the moon. Her parents were pagans. Her parents came out of that religion, and at some point in her life, the Lord reached down and intercepted her will, and he saved her, and he brought her from the deadness and the death of her pagan background and into the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that God has redeemed her, and she is a faithful helper in the church. He says that there again in verse 1. This Phoebe, notice, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. Now, the word that Paul uses here gives us our word for deacon. And there's a lot of back and forth and questions. Was she an actual female deacon in the church? or was? But regardless of all of those kind of conversations, she was a faithful servant. That's actually what the word means. Uh, Even if one has an office of deacon or not, the, the word means they are serving the church in all kinds of capacities. In one sense, and Christians are called this elsewhere in Scripture, in one sense, all members of the body of Christ are deacons. They're all serving the body of Christ. But Paul is calling her out here because she has served in some unique way. Phoebe was evidently a woman with such a role in the church, and Paul was able to trust her with deep and great responsibility. In fact, there's a lot more we could say here, but many scholars believe that he mentions her first in this long list, this litany of names here, because she may have been the one who carried the scroll containing Romans to the church at Rome. Paul had sent her. She was like a messenger. She was one who could go and and take this on behalf of uh, of Paul. In fact, D. Edmund Hebert quotes someone from old, and he says, she bore in the folds of her robe the whole future of Christian theology. Uh, Whether that's the case or not, Paul obviously trusted her, and she came to mind as Paul begins to mention these names in the the back-and-forth mutual ministry between the churches in Rome and where Paul is. Also in verse 1, this is the first occurrence of the word church in Romans. And Paul always uses this word to refer to a specific local church. And here, the church is at Centria. Phoebe comes from a small port village town, which is just seven miles from Corinth, which is where Paul is writing this from. He's writing from Corinth to Roman, to the church at Rome. And so she's close by. He knows her. She's a part of the church in that small village of Centria. And Paul had spent 18 months in that area. And during this time, the churches were established there, and Paul would have gotten to know many of the believers. I've gotten to know many of you just over the last couple of days. I would imagine that if I were to go on and spend the next 18 months with you, we would have even more stories and relationships and understanding of one another and and mutual encouragements. Paul says there in verse 2, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she bore, for she herself has also been a helper. That word helper means a, a patron of many and of myself as well. A helper, how? He uses the word patron. Some of the translations, the NIV says a benefactor. The word does not refer to someone who is a leader in the church, but it refers to rather to someone who gives material support to the strangers, to the poor, to missionaries, in this case to apostles. It was used to describe someone who often would look after the legal protection of strangers and freemen. They were some who would at times have legal training or at least be involved in the the care of those who needed that kind of legal protection, especially in the financial support of that. It's believed by most that Phoebe was likely unmarried or by this time a widow and very likely had substantial means. 
as Paul uses that particular word for patron. So she is a financial supporter. Ministry comes with a price tag attached to it. I often say that in our church that a lot of the things that we want to do, whether it's send missionaries or expand facilities or add staff to our pastoral staff, those kind of things, it, it, it takes resources to do those kinds of things. And all of that uh, rests on the, the giving, the free-willed giving and the, the generosity of the people of God as we pull our resources together to do those kind of things. Whatever the case may be, she did not view her situation, whether as a, as a single woman or as a widow, she didn't view her situation as tragic or meaningless. She used her position in life to serve the church, to meet real needs in the body of Christ. And she had a view of ministry that was bigger than her own backyard. Phoebe, the former pagan, was an exemplary redeemed servant. These are the kinds of people, the men and women, that the Lord uses to build up his church. Secondly, we might have another category here in verses 2 through 5. It's what I would call ministry marriages. Husband and wife teams that, that fulfill all kinds of ministries in the church, behind the scenes and on the stage and in missions and so many things. He says in verse 3, greet Prisca or Priscilla, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. This is a husband and wife team. And these two comprise probably the most prominent and notable ministry marriage in the New Testament. Six times they're mentioned. They are well known and pop up in all sorts of places during Paul's ministry. This was for the Apostle Paul, truly a, a lifelong or ministry-long friendship for Paul and this couple. One person says it this way, they furnish the most beautiful example known to us in the apostolic age of the power for good <clears throat> that could be exerted by a husband and a wife working in unison for the advancement of the gospel. What a great statement. A husband and wife team that said, we're not only committed to one another, but as one flesh, we are committed to the body of Christ. We are committed to the mission of the church. We will do what God calls us to do. They move, this couple moves from Rome to Corinth to Ephesus, back to Rome, and then back to Ephesus. Uh, that's not a call for everybody. That's, that's a, that can be a great hardship for many people. But they have spent their life in ministry, moving from one place to the other. We're first introduced to them in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 18, where we learn something of their background and how they came to be there. And I'll let you read that later. But Paul met them in Corinth, where they had, had to move because of the Roman emperor had expelled Jews from Rome. Luke also tells us that they had set up business there in Corinth. And for 18 months, Paul was in Corinth and he lived with them. You know, you get to know somebody when you stay in their house or you have someone stay in your house. I've gotten to know my, my host over the last few days. I imagine if I went on 18 months more, which they have not extended that invite to me, uh, but if I were to go on 18 months more, we might get to know uh, a, a, a lot more about each other. Well, Paul lived with Priscilla and Aquila for 18 months there in Corinth. And then not only that, Paul eventually left Corinth with Priscilla and Aquila and landed in Ephesus. And again, he lived with them for almost three years. You get to know a lot about people when you live with them. But notice what he calls to mind as he remembers them. He says in verse 4, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles also greet the church that is in their house. We do not know, we do not know exactly what event Paul is speaking to when he says that they risked their necks. Not only was Paul grateful for their risk, for him, but all the Gentile churches ultimately owed them thanks. Think about it this way. We, we know very little about Priscilla and Aquila, but, but here's what's going on. They saved Paul's life, at least on one occasion, maybe possibly many others. And were it not for them in the providence of God, we might not even have the book of Romans. Romans. 
He says in verse 3, they labored for Christ. In verse 4, they sacrificed much for Paul and the churches. Verse 5, we see that they gave of themselves, even of their own home, as they opened it up to the church. We heard our brother uh, from Croatia talk about how the church there is meeting in his home. Very similar here. Here's what's key, and here's what I want you to remember about them. It's strategic for them to be in Rome because Paul has never been there. We covered that ground yesterday. Paul has not been to Rome yet, and and so they're there ahead of him. They are ones who are going ahead and saying, I know him, we've been with him, he's lived with us, we can vouch for him, we know his character, we know his doctrine, we need to receive him. So they know Paul better than anyone, and they can give witness to his character, his ministry, his desires to go through their church on his planned mission to Spain. Not only that, you might know that they worked their trade together. They were tent makers, or it might be uh, leather workers. We're not entirely sure what was involved in their work, but Paul had a, what's called a tent making ministry where he would, he would work his own job and use that to support a, a majority of his ministry, and they were doing much the same, and they met in that kind of field. They ministered together. They worked together. They lived together. It's through partnerships like this that the Lord furthers the work of the gospel. Paul sends his very last letter to his young protege named Timothy. Timothy is at Ephesus, where Paul had lived with them for those few years. And at the very end of his final letters, one of the last things that Paul says, the dying Paul remembers them in the very last days of his life in 2 Timothy 4, verse 19. For every apostle that labored in those early days, for every faithful pastor in this world, for every called seminary student, there are untold ministry marriages that have played a significant yet private role in and behind such public ministries. We often think of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, or you might think of the ministry of someone, some famous preacher that you know. It it, it never exists for just that person or because of that person. Every missionary will tell you there are untold names and faces and marriages like this that have gone into their life and ministry and poured into them. Now, we won't spend as much time on the rest of these that are in this list because, as you see here, we simply don't have much information. But Paul does leave us certain indications as as we go along here as to how these others were used in the church. And now I'm going to move a a little quicker here. Number three, he also uses mature believers, mature believers. If you look at the end of verse five, you see this. Greet Epinatus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. Likely Ephesus, uh, the cultural center of Asia. It's a church like Rome that had been around for a while, but, but they're always in need of mature believers. And what Paul says here is something that shouldn't be taken for granted. You don't earn a reputation for spiritual maturity by just outlasting everyone. Maturity, spiritual maturity doesn't come just because we've lived a long time and we have some gray hair or bald heads, whatever the case may be. You get spiritual maturity by being spiritually mature and grasping and and, and excelling still more in the day-to-day as a young believer and as you grow old and you become dependable. Paul reaches back. There was somebody who was a first convert many years ago, and now he's still following the Lord. He's still faithful to the Lord. He's a mature believer. You want to point that out in your church. You see, number four, faithful laborers faithful laborers. Notice the language that Paul uses. I'm going to skip around a little bit here. If you look at verse 6, greet Mary. There are many Marys in the New Testament, but this is another one. Greet Mary. Notice how he says this, who has worked hard for you. Think of the the Marys that make up our church, the women that make up the church who are working hard in ways and secret ways and behind the scenes and supporting so many different ministries. We don't know anything else about this woman except she was a faithful worker. Look down at verse 9. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Again, worked hard, fellow worker. 
These two names in verse 9 have been found together on inscriptions detailing slaves who served in emperors' households. It's very likely that these two are those names that have been found in those inscriptions. They were servants in an emperor's household in Rome, and yet they belong to Christ. And Paul says not only is he a, a worker in an emperor's household, he is a fellow worker of mine in the ministry. Verse 12, greet Tryphania and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved who has worked hard in the Lord. You, you see a common theme here, don't you? These are all faithful laborers. Now, what's interesting there in verse 12, uh, Tryphania and Tryphosa, the first two names are slave names, and they actually mean delicate and dainty. Most scholars believe these are likely twin sisters. Uh, their names are right there together, and, and their mother and father called them delicate and dainty. That's uh, really interesting. Their names have been found together as servants in the Roman emperor's household. So again, we have those who are serving in high places, but Paul says more importantly than that, they are serving the body of Christ. They are workers in the Lord. Persis that's mentioned there with them too, it, it, what all of these have in common is that they labored in the Lord and for you, Paul says. You have faithful labors. Number five, very similar to Priscilla and Aquila, we said ministry marriages. I think number five, you also have missionary marriages. We've heard that all throughout the weekend. Verse seven, missionary marriages. Similar to Aquila and Priscilla, but likely even more mobile and even pioneering when it came to missions. Verse 7, greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. They've been following Christ longer than Paul. Not only that, uh, he, he says they are kinsmen. They're likely, uh, they're, they're Jews. They are fellow Jews of Paul. They've been fellow prisoners. Jews were being persecuted at that time, especially in Rome. They are outstanding among the apostles. This doesn't mean that they are apostles. It means they have a reputation that is known to the apostles and relished and loved by them. Aquila and Priscilla helped plant the church, and then they hosted churches in their home. This is a couple that stands out in one particular way that Paul mentions here. He says that they are those who have sacrificed much. Whatever the case of their life, this is obviously a couple that has moved around, has been faithful in getting out the gospel message. To the point, like Paul, they have gone to prison for it. There are those in missionary marriages and families that have sacrificed much. Again, we're going to keep moving fast here. Number six, we see in verse eight, beloved friends. I'm making more friends this weekend. I love that aspect. Dave has, Dave, Pastor David has been a beloved friend now for a number of years. And, and with a beloved friend, when you haven't seen them in a while, it, it's, it's not like you're retreading all the old ground. When you get back together, you're just picking up where you left off. And, and you're talking about life and ministry. And, and this is how you speak of those things. He says there in verse 8, greet, greet Ampelitis or Ampelitis, my beloved in the Lord. This is someone who I love. They're dear to me. I care for them. I've gotten to know people over the years. Um, my dear brother Melvin, uh, that we met in Italy last year. He came from Honduras. I came from Alabama. We met in Italy. We didn't know each other. and We got to know each other, and we ate a lot in Italy. And we toured around. And we ministered together. And then I show up here, and here he is. And we, we have a pack now that we're going to travel the world and just eat together. But becoming beloved friends, and we just pick up. I don't know what country or where we'll be uh, together next, but we'll just pick up where we left off. My beloved in the Lord. Beloved friends. Number seven, influential believers. Now, this is really interesting here. Influential believers in verses 10 and 11. Influential believers because they're in influential places. Notice verse 10. Notice the grammar and the language very carefully. Greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. 
He doesn't say greet Aristobulus. Greet those who are in his household. First of all, verse 10, the approved means tested, worthy, someone of high regard, much like uh, Ampelatus, he's beloved and he's known. But that name there at the end of verse 10, Aristobulus, is a name that anyone in Rome would have recognized. He was the brother of King Herod Agrippa I, who was the ruler of Palestine from AD 41 to 44. He is the Herod was the one who was directly judged by God in Acts 12. We learn here in verse 10, very interesting, that there are some believers who serve in his household staff. Notice very carefully too, verse 11, very similar. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. So this is a Jew uh, of the uh, the Herodians. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus. Who are in the Lord. Again, very similar to what we just saw in verse 10. Herodian refers to a Jewish slave who worked in the service of one of the Herods. Narcissus, this name here, he doesn't say, again, doesn't say greet him, but greet those who are in his household. There are believers who work for him. Now, that name too would have been very famous. To see Narcissus, no pun intended, it would be like reading about the Kardashians today. Narcissus was a well-known politician who served under the evil Roman emperor Claudius. Narcissus was well-known. In fact, he made headlines just before Paul wrote this. He had committed suicide just before Paul wrote this letter, and it made national news in Rome. Now note carefully in verse 11, that Paul tells us that there are some in his household, which could mean family members or one of the many full-time live-in workers, and they are in the Lord. These are believers in influential places that are not exalting those places, but using where they are to serve the Lord. I'm running out of time here, but let me give you one of my favorites here. Number eight, adoptive parents. Adoptive parents. Now, this is really interesting, and you're going to have to study this out further. And let me encourage you, a cross-reference with verse 13 is Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Verse 13 here says, Greet Rufus, a choice, a chosen man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Isn't that interesting? You ever said this to someone? She's like a mother to me, right? Uh, Some of the mothers of this church... Uh, are like mothers to some of the other younger people of this church and some of the, uh, the families of this church who don't have families here or uh, they've lost their family or their mothers. Paul says much the same thing here. She's a mother to me. Now what's interesting here, and I wish I had time to explore this, is that this Rufus, uh, we know who he is, we know who his brother is because it's mentioned in Mark chapter 15, Rufus and Alexander were brothers and their father was a man named Simon the Cyrene. Do you remember him? You remember when Jesus is carrying the cross and they pull out of the crowd a man named Simon? That was his father. And so Rufus's mother is Simon's wife. In all likelihood, and most everybody believes this who've studied these passages, Rufus and Alexander, the young brothers, were there as they saw their father plucked out and forced to carry the cross of Jesus, that cross beam. Rufus is an eyewitness to what Christ was doing on that blessed day. And not only that, they became great servants in the church, and Rufus had a reputation in the church So much so that Mark calls him out there in Mark 15. And now Rufus's mother has become like a mother to Paul. Well, I need to to close up here. Let me give you one more. Number nine, close congregations. Close congregations. Verse 14, uh, greet Asyncritus, uh, Philagan, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brethren with them. Greet This is a husband and wife, Philogus and Julia. Julia means child of Jupiter. Again, here are the pagan backgrounds in this. Uh, Neurus and his sister, likely that was their children. Olympus and all the saints who were with them. There were others too, 
he says there at the end of verse 15, but Paul doesn't know them. All the saints who are with them. Paul's acknowledging something here. There's, there's many others, and, and I don't even have time to name them all, and I don't even know all their names. And then he says in verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. Family, sincerity, warmth, a genuine love for one another. Now, let's, let me give a warning here. There's a greeting with a kiss in another passage in Scripture. And you might remember that. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was betrayed with a kiss. And so let us not confuse an outward show of emotion or even a warm greeting with a true converted heart. It might even be betrayal. And, and I'm not saying that so that you will now suspect everyone and their greetings of one another. But we're saying something that's even more important than this. More important than just what we do outwardly is who we are inwardly. And then that's expressed outwardly in hugs and kisses and handshakes and care for one another. What you have here in some are close congregations that love one another, that care for one another. And greetings are extended to them in that way. All the churches in Christ greet you. We have here young, old, single men, women, many individuals, many different stories and backgrounds, but all coming together in this church, in my church in Huntsville, to form the body of Christ. And that design for healthy ministry has remained unchanged for 2,000 years. I can't wait to hear of all the names that have been so instrumental in the mission of the body of Christ. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for hearing the word of God this weekend, for letting me be with you. And we pray that the Lord will strengthen this church, that he will embolden you in the mission as we make and nurture disciples. Much love to you and thank you for your time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We love one another because you first loved us. We love you because you first loved us. We love your mission because you first loved us. And we pray, Lord, that as a church, we would be faithful to the end until you call our name and number at the very end and say, your time is finished. Lord, that we would put our hands to the plow that you've given us. That we would be faithful in the, in the ministries that you have allotted to each one of us, understanding that the Lord uses all kinds of gifts and services and ministries in the body. Thank you for this church. We pray that you would continue to bless it and strengthen it in the days to come in the power of your word and in the enabling of your spirit for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.